Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. The headlines this week, scientists at the Large Hadron Collider have turned lead into gold, chimpanzees sometimes look after each other, and a new Herrerasaurian dinosaur is discovered. In our title story this week, it's a very fun bit of physics news as scientists have managed to do what wizards have been trying to accomplish for hundreds of years, turn lead into gold. This happened during one of those experiments at the Large Hadron Collider where they fire incredibly small particles at each other at incredibly high speeds. They were observing the quark-gluon plasma that could form when lead nuclei collided with one another, a state of matter that scientists believe filled the universe a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. From this quark-gluon plasma came the matter that we are so familiar with now. These nuclei that get fired at each other are, obviously, really rather small, so they're not always actually colliding. What happens more often is that the nuclei pass by each other, but this can have its own effects, often triggering a curious process called electromagnetic dissociation. A lead nucleus has a relatively strong electromagnetic field, and these nuclei are travelling rather fast indeed just 0.000007% off the speed of light. This somewhat flattens the electromagnetic field and creates a pulse of photons, which in turn can lead to protons in the lead nuclei to be ejected from it, leaving behind another element. This can end up creating thallium, mercury, and occasionally a nucleus will be left behind with 79 protons, which is the amount in a gold atom. Before you get your hopes up and your scales out, the total amount of gold created during these experiments is very minimal indeed. You would need trillions times the amount of gold nuclei created to actually make anything from it. As if that wasn't bad enough for the wizards amongst you who have thrown down their wands and staffs in anger, the gold only exists for a fraction of a second before it flies into another part of the LHC and is obliterated. Still. A fun story to show how science is further edging its way towards the magic of the past. A couple of months ago, we reported on a story about mice exhibiting first aid behaviours. Well, perhaps after that, it's not so surprising that this week, new research has been published that documents details of these rarely observed first aid behaviours in chimpanzees. Chimpanzees are known to tend to wounds inflicted both on themselves and on other chimps as well. There have been multiple documented cases of chimpanzees helping one another out of human-made snares. One case talked about in this study is one where a male chimpanzee helped an unrelated female from a game snare and is thought to have saved her life. It is these interactions between unrelated individuals that create the most excitement, as it points to a deeper altruism that can help us understand the evolution of empathy and caring behaviour in our own species. Another example was of a young male chimpanzee tending to a wound on another unrelated young male. This kind of behaviour isn't without risks, and researchers have found it particularly interesting that this is happening between two individuals that might, one day, consider themselves rivals. Despite chimpanzees giving a helping hand to unrelated individuals, they don't always help each other out. And it is this behaviour that scientists are so keen to understand, why it is that these remarkable animals will go out of their way to help each other selectively rather than as a general behavioural rule. First up in the paleontology news this week, we have a new species of dinosaur. It's part of the group known as the Herrerasaurians, a very interesting lineage of dinosaurs that lived during the Triassic period and represent some of the oldest known larger carnivorous dinosaurs to have evolved. This new species is named Maleraptor kutyi, and it was uncovered in approximately 220 million year old rocks in India. It's known from a few pieces of the hip plus a tail vertebra from further back and all the bones show the characteristic features of coming from a Herrerasaurian. 
Maleroraptor is particularly significant as it fills a gap in time between the older initial radiation of the Hererosaurs in South America some 233 million years ago and the younger members of the lineage known from North America about 213 million years ago. So, a pretty cool discovery revealing some new information about this interesting lineage of dinosaurs. Also in the Paleo News this week, Truodon has returned. This carnivorous dinosaur has a long and contentious history. The first fossil of this animal was discovered in 1855 as a single tooth uncovered from central Mitania. This tooth was then named the next year as the species Truodon formosus, but it wasn't until the 1980s that its true identity was established once some more material from this species was described by paleontologists, such as jaws containing more teeth, and so scientists were able to work out that it was a small meat-eating dinosaur that was also fairly closely related to birds. However, there's been some debate over the validity of the name Truodon, considering that the fossil material its name was based on is incredibly fragmentary. This led to some researchers suggesting that Truodon should instead be known as Stenonychosaurus, since more complete fossils are known of this species. But now paleontologists have examined some previously undescribed fossil material that they found belonged to Truodon. This includes some more parts of the skull, pieces of the hips, and a toe bone. Using this new material and looking back at the rules for establishing the names of species, the researchers argue that there is indeed enough of Truodon known to science for it to take priority over Stenonychosaurus. So, Truodon is back at last. In order to transition to cleaner energy, the North Sea is experiencing a rapid expansion of offshore wind farms. Also in the North Sea are almost 20 species of elasmobranchs, that is, sharks and rays, and there is concern about the effects that wind farms may have on this vulnerable group of fish. A wind turbine is expected to be operational for 40 years, but there is little data on how these turbines will influence elasmobranch habitat, species distribution, or behavior. However, a recently published paper has suggested that wind farms may offer protection to marine life. Researchers have collected traces of eDNA in seawater from several shark and ray species in and around Dutch wind farms, confirming that elasmobranchs use offshore wind farms as a habitat. Within wind farms, trawling and other forms of seabed disturbing fishing are prohibited, which is allowing benthic ecosystems to recover and could benefit vulnerable species such as sharks and rays. There is also a reef effect due to the hard substrate used for scour protection of the turbine foundation, which may also benefit elasmobranchs depending on species-specific habitat and dietary preferences. Species such as cod and lobster have already been shown to benefit from these effects, but further research is needed to fully understand the behavior and the purpose of the habitat use by elasmobranchs in and around offshore wind farms. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. You can follow Seven Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Cowam, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Bather, Diana Hernandez, Drove Shrivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, John French, Joseph Ree, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Prieprajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Patrikas, congratulations if that change of name is because of a marriage, Schlom, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.